LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, part two of my conversation with Casey Means. In part one of my conversation with Casey, we learned that most of our healthcare challenges stem from poor metabolic health. That's the cellular processes that power our bodies, driven by what we eat and how we move. We learned about the miracle of the human body, the limitations of our healthcare system, and the biomarkers we can use to assess the state of our health. And we learned that improving the way we eat and move can not only transform our health in just a month or two, but it will also improve our mood and give us that frisky, youthful feeling of boundless energy, good energy, as Casey calls it. If you haven't listened to part one, you should go back and listen to that episode. But if you have listened, you're probably wondering, what should I eat? What lifestyle patterns should I change? Well, in this conversation, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and get into the details. There were many surprises here for me, like should grains be part of a healthy diet? What's the correct amount of added sugar to be eating? And what's better, butter or vegetable oils? The overall message is empowering. We can all have the things we love, Casey tells us. It's just about getting a bit creative. So let's start with the basics. What should we be eating? I mean, the very simple answer to this is that we should be eating as much as humanly possible, the freshest, organic, unprocessed foods from the highest quality soil that we can possibly find. So what does this really mean? It means as much as you can buy food from the farmer's market, from farmers that you can talk to about their farms, and use the food that week, or if you're not going to use it in a few days, freeze it, because freezing saves a lot of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to meat, poultry, eggs, and milk, absolutely grass-fed, pasture-raised, ideally regenerative, the molecular composition of those products is going to be totally different than if it's grown on a factory farm in the middle of Iowa with a cow or a chicken that's fed corn and and soy. And then when it comes to fish, smaller, wild-caught fish are going to typically be lower mercury. However, there are some really interesting trends happening with actually regenerative farmed fish, which is basically aquaponic artisanally raised farmed fish that I'm actually really interested in because I'm typically was anti-farmed fish, but there's now some really thoughtful, regenerative aquaponic farmers that actually are, are doing it right. So long story short, if I have one rule for people, it's, it's just know that the highest quality food and the freshest food you can buy which means likely locally grown, is going to be giving your body the most nutrients possible. And meeting the nutrient needs of your body is ultimately what generates health and not overwhelming the body with things that can't process well, like toxins and pesticides and ultra-processed grains and oils. Those are things that gum up the system. So get rid of the ultra-processed stuff, eat the fresh, sustainably grown stuff that's filled with the most possible nutrients, and that is the backbone of good health. And that can apply to any quote-unquote dietary philosophy, vegan or carnivore, focus on quality. My conversation with Casey Means continues in just a sec. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. What's your view on meat, how much we should eat, and protein? This is an area of debate. Like, you know, Peter Atia has been very emphatically making the case that the recommended daily allowances of of protein are not nearly adequate if you're exercising in a healthy way. Are you in favor of eating substantially more protein than most Americans do? 
I don't want to avoid the answer here, but this is where I actually go back to that statement that I made of don't trust me, don't trust your doctor, don't trust the science, don't trust influencers, trust yourself. Because every single person is biochemically individual. And the protein I need now at 36 versus the protein I need at 50 is probably going to be very different based on my estrogen levels and what's happening in my body. Postpartum, I'm going to need different protein than I do now. So for me to say this is what you need is tough. Now, there are general rules I can say, which is that like we know that protein is an anabolic substance that helps us with muscle protein synthesis, especially specific amino acids, and we need muscle to be optimally healthy. So yes, we probably want to be getting thoughtfully more high-quality protein in our lives than we are in our country because we are very under-muscled in this country and we need to be lifting a lot more weight. But what I would say is how to know if you're on the right diet. Very simple. Two things. What are your symptoms? And what are your biomarkers? And how are they changing over time? If you have optimal metabolic biomarkers and your body composition is optimal and you have no symptoms and diseases, you are probably on the right diet for this time in your life. Interesting. And so, but I think you would say that if you eat meats that are grass-fed, pasture-raised, that is a healthy part of uh, of a balanced diet. You can also be healthy on a vegetarian or vegan diet, right? If you if you're careful, but you yourself consume meat and think it can be part of a healthy diet. I do. Yeah, I mean, I have one page in my book that essentially says like these are things that I all think can be healthy for a human, and it's essentially organic, ideally regenerative, all fruits and vegetables nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, herbs, spices, dairy, poultry, fish, beef, eggs. But the common denominator is regenerative, high quality, real, unprocessed, as you know, as natural as possible. One sentence in your book dealt me a little bit of a blow. You write, I see no major benefit to adding grains in any form to the diet. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's a tough position because I happen to love, Casey, a Thanksgiving sandwich with turkey and cranberry sauce and some mm-hmm. tomatoes and, you know, on toast, right? I mean, the reason why I took a stand on this in the book is because 93% of American adults have metabolic dysfunction, which means they have a fundamental problem in how they're processing carbohydrates in the body. And there are large epidemiologic studies showing that whole grains can be associated with a healthful dietary pattern, Mm -hmm, certainly. But a lot of those studies came out when not 50% of American adults had prediabetes or type 2 diabetes and fundamental intolerance of glucose. And so what a lot of the rationale for why whole grains are healthful is because they contain some vitamins and they contain some minerals and they contain fiber which is great. Fiber is super important. But there are other foods with much lower glucose and carbohydrate potential, carbohydrate and therefore turning into glucose in the bloodstream that also have more fiber and more vitamins and minerals. So I mentioned things like basil seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, flax seeds, which you could eat a very small amount and get vastly more of the things that make whole grains healthful Then if you ate the whole grains, which comes along with 30, 40, 50 grams of carbohydrates that are going into an already carbon-tolerant body. So the point I'm trying to make is for the context of the American body and the fact that 95 plus percent of grains in the U.S. are not organic, they're covered in glyphosate and pesticides, which are going to add harm to our gut lining, And the fact that because of our poor gut integrity, because of all these other factors in the U.S., like our overuse of antibiotics and our overuse of NSAID pain medication and our overuse of sugar, which all hurt the gut, because of the context that grains are going into in the average American body, putting in more pesticide-covered grains into an already damaged gut lining, I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing so much more non-celiac gluten sensitivity because it's context. So in this moment, in American history and American biology, I don't think it's a necessary thing for health. And I think for many people, it's actually unintentionally helping them. Now, again, trust yourself. If you are a person who has great gut integrity, is eating a perfect diet, and it's going to make yourself whole grain, fermented, sourdough, organic bread, you don't have a huge glucose response, it's probably okay for you. 
That's good to know. So if, if right, if all the markers are are healthy, a whole wheat sourdough or pickled rye or something could be okay for us. And and quinoa is better than rice, we think. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily put quinoa above rice. I would say, you know, look at the nutrient profile of the different grains you're doing and, you know, search for the thing that's going to have the most fiber and the most vitamins and minerals and and ideally, of course, organic. So I think for you as an individual, I feel like I, you probably stick with your sourdough toast, or, you know, at, at Thanksgiving. But the other thing that's fun that I loved, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is there are so many swap alternatives that are great. So yes. I actually still love that Friday Thanksgiving sandwich, but I make flax almond flour bread because I, I do not do well with grains personally. And so, yeah, so for me, I still have the sandwich, but I just use a different type of bread that I make and it's easy and it's healthy and it's organic. And, you know, we can all have the things we love. It's just about getting a little bit creative in the context of the way our bodies are in this world. I'll have to try that. Yeah, the um, I was delighted to discover flaxseed crackers. Yes. Because we all do like a little crunch, right? <laughs> and so, yes. You know, and I, I did have a habit. One of my very naughty habits, Casey, I'm just going to come clean here, up until just a few weeks ago, is that I would, because I engage in time-restricted eating and only eat in an eight-hour window, which we can talk about, by the time I get to lunch, I'm so famished that when they put this fresh bread and butter in front of me while I'm waiting for my salad to come out, <laughs> I just I just cave, you know. But now I know, now I know because I have uh, your continuous glucose monitor on the back of my left arm that eating on an empty stomach, bread, and oftentimes with refined grains, it can just spike your glucose and we shouldn't do it. And so it turns out that the sequencing of, of how we eat also matters. Yeah, it does. There are subtle things that you can do that can have a difference on how you digest food, one of which is by putting more fiber and, and roughage in, in your tummy before putting in a big, you know, carbohydrate load. So this could be eating like a salad with greens and chicken and protein at the beginning of your meal before maybe eating something starchier. And what that does is it adds this sort of like fibrous mesh layer to your stomach and your small intestines and actually may block some of the absorption of glucose into the body, the breakdown of carbohydrates, um, and also slow digestion so you're less hungry. So there are things you can do um, like sequencing of meals, pairing high carbohydrate foods with more fiber and, and healthy protein that can have a have an impact on our glucose rise. And, and again, the reason the glucose rise, a, a subtle glucose rise in and of itself is not a big problem. It's when we have those really quick and sharp spikes and crashes that is often when after that spike and crash, we feel very, very hungry. That's that We know that that actually stimulates cravings. So for people who are dealing with a lot of food cravings and that sense of like a high and then a low after a meal, figuring out ways to stabilize the blood sugar in a moderate amount can actually get us off that roller coaster of sort of big spike, big crash, big spike, big crash, which most yes. Americans are on with the standard American diet. And another really great one is walking after meals yes. because what you're doing is instead of instead of having all the glucose having to be taken out of the bloodstream by insulin being secreted to basically shuttle glucose into the cells out of the bloodstream, you're actually activating muscle to pull glucose out of the bloodstream into the muscle in a way that does not require insulin. So you're kind of soaking up glucose for this, essentially to get used, as opposed to just going down the pathway of big insulin spike, big glucose crash, and kind of overwhelming the cells to process it or store it. So walking after meals can be a phenomenal way, even, even if it's just for 10 minutes, and it doesn't have to be walking, it can really just be moving, anything that's going to activate your muscles to help process some of that load from the meal so you're not getting on that whiplash of, uh, of glucose. I think you say air squats are an option, and I've tried that. Uh, my wife and I are going to try to get into the habit of the postprandial walk. You know, that's a good thing to do. But yeah, you say don't eat naked carbohydrates. Uh, and, and I think I remember that you discourage eating a banana on its own, <laughs> which really which really took me back because I, I thought a naked banana, I, I'm not even supposed to have a naked banana. Why shouldn't we eat naked carbohydrates and, and what are they? Yeah, I well, the first thing I would say is that this is another one where it's like, 
again, don't don't take any of the advice on face value in the book. Like if you wear a continuous glucose monitor and you eat straight fruit and have very little glucose rise, like that's fantastic. For many people, though, eating one of the higher sugar fruits will actually send their blood sugar up 50, 60, 70 points and then come crashing down. And then if you were to maybe add almonds, almond butter, or put sliced banana on chia seed pudding, which has both fat fiber actually Mm -hmm. and protein with coconut milk or something like that, all of those things may slow digestion because there's fiber, slow the amount of glucose that's actually getting from the gut into the bloodstream and therefore mitigate some of the, the big spike that happens. And so tuning into that, like I know that after, for me, a handful of grapes can actually send my blood sugar up 100 points. And so- That's astounding. Yeah. It's astounding. And and it's when you see that, it's like you have to see it to believe it. But oddly, if I eat like a fairly unripe pear or an orange, like a small orange or an organic apple, I, I have virtually no glucose spike. Mm-hmm. So people say, people will misinterpret this and say, oh my gosh, this this doctor is saying that fruit is bad for us. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that in my body, certain fruits has a, have a disproportionately higher glucose response. And I am also not saying that one glucose spike is going to hurt you. For me, on that day, when I have a 100-point glucose spike and then a subsequent crash, I don't feel great. Yeah. So I would like to avoid that. And therefore, I will choose different fruits that keep me more stable or find ways to mitigate the spike through protein, fat, fiber, walking after the meal, doing those things that mitigate it. So it's just about being a more informed consumer, not about really strict rules. Mm-hmm. And this is what's so fascinating about wearing a continuous glucose monitor is you can see your body responding. I have a practice of when when our family goes out for brunch on the weekends, I'll have a sort of frittata or something that's, you know, eggs and vegetables, something pretty healthy. But my dastardly wife will order some delicious little chocolate twist, basically chocolate eclairs that are just out of the oven. You have to picture this. And they just, they're sitting there and I haven't eaten, and it's noon, and of course, my willpower collapses. I have three bites, but this happens just a few days ago with my uh, CGM applied, and I watch my blood glucose go from 85 to like 140. Wow. From three or four bites. And so what that changed in my mind was this notion that I, I always used to think of sort of you know, eating something unhealthy as being bad in proportion to how much of it I ate. Mm. Right. But what I see when I'm watching my blood glucose in real time is that actually a, a relatively small amount can cause this crazy spike. And I think it's useful to maybe explain to people what is it about glucose spikes that make them unhealthy? I would say that a single glucose spike is not necessarily unhealthy. Like our body is designed and equipped to handle a glucose spike. It's we're really looking for trends here and how much we're spiking over time. Because what we do know is that high glycemic variability, which means like up, down, up, down, up, down, like lots of spikes and, and dips throughout the day, high glycemic variability is associated with worse long-term health outcomes. Cause it's really it's putting your body under you know a lot of stress, essentially. And so we want to understand what causes us to spike so we can avoid trends of high glycemic variability. And then more broadly, regular glucose spikes can lead to inflammation. It can actually cause the immune system to get upregulated. It can cause what's called oxidative stress, which is damaging free radicals and essentially molecules that uh, can cause damage in the body. And then this one's actually the most easy to visualize. High blood sugar can cause glycation, which is where sugar in the bloodstream literally just sticks to things. It when there's too much sugar floating around in the bloodstream, it can bind to things like the blood vessel lining. Um, It can bind to cell membranes. And when that happens, glycation is not a good thing. It causes dysfunction. And the higher concentration of blood sugar, the more likely you're going to glycate things. And, And a really easy way to drive that point home is that when we get our hemoglobin A1C checked at the doctor's office, it's looking at the percentage of the hemoglobin molecules in our blood that have sugar stuck to them, glycated hemoglobin. That's he- and so that's why it's actually given you to you as a percentage, because it's percentage of hemoglobin tested that has sugar stuck to it that's glycated. So we do not want to glycate things in our body. That's not good. And for people listening who may be using a skincare regimen, 
one of the key reasons we get wrinkles in our bodies and faces is because sugar sticks to collagen in the skin and cross-links it, and that leads to wrinkles. So glycation has, when that's happening in the skin, it can look like wrinkles, but in the blood vessel lining, it can look like much worse. So we don't want to glycate things. That's the reason we want to keep, you know, spikes and average glucose levels down over time. But above and beyond all of that, the one that I think is most relevant to everyone, and I think the most compelling reason why we want to avoid even a single big, big glucose spike is because when we have a really high spike, our body releases tons of insulin and we can have that crash, which basically means that the body overcompensates, soaks up all the glucose, and our post-meal glucose actually dips lower than our baseline before the meal. And research has shown that that postprandial hypoglycemia, meaning post-meal low blood sugar, is when we have cravings and sometimes when people have fatigue and anxiety. So if you've ever had that high sugar breakfast and then mid-morning you're starving, you want another frappuccino, you're feeling a little cranky, you want to take a nap, that is possibly a post-meal crash. And so one of the just acute benefits of just stabilizing your glucose is that you avoid that instability, that subjective instability that we can sometimes feel. And I think a lot of people have these magic moments where they put on a continuous glucose monitor and they realize, oh my God, I'm not actually a person who just happens to be exhausted at 2 p.m. every day. I'm having a glucose crash every day at 2 p.m. Like that's what's happening. And I could just tweak that a little bit. And then it like actually it becomes a very much like an identity shift. Like, whoa, I didn't know that that coffee drink I get every day after lunch is causing this thing that I thought was just like part of my persona. And it's very empowering. And and isn't it the case that too many glucose spikes throughout the day and then over weeks and months and years creates inflammation, which down the road has all kinds of bad effects? Yeah, that's right. The three, the three like longer term effects would be inflammation, glycation, and oxidative stress. And those are the things that we want to like avoid these trends of regular spikes because they can lead to those things. Which in turn increases risks of cancer, heart disease, everything bad. All the things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's that's like creating essentially an environment in the body which is conducive to all the pathology that we're seeing today and everything we can do to minimize oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction is fundamentally going to help set us up for reduction of chronic diseases. And one of the ways that we can do that is by reducing our glycemic variability over time. Another tough sentence for me, Casey, in the book was, you say the correct amount of added sugars to eat is zero. (laughs) Zero (laughs) added sugars. So zero is a pretty low number. What do you say to folks who say, Casey is a party pooper. Come on, Casey, live a little. (laughs) I definitely hear that (laughs) from many people in my life. But I think, you know, it is just important to recognize that the body doesn't need a single gram of added sugar in an entire lifetime. It is totally, totally unnecessary. And I will be very clear, added sugar is not the same as naturally occurring sugar in food, like from fruit Mm -hmm. or dates or, or things that, you know, have sugar, carrots, whatever. That's sugar that's bound up in tens of thousands of plant molecules that make it an ecosystem that the body can understand and handle. When you're stripping sugar out from things like sugar beets or sugar cane, refining it so it's almost like a drug-like form, and then adding it to food specifically to make it hyper palatable and addicting, that's when you start going into that area where, you know, it's it's not something our body knows what to do with. And I think for people, so so the, the key point is we don't need any of that added sugar. There's no, there's no biologic no. necessity. It's doing nothing really but causing problems. However, there are like, for instance, for me, I have, I know exactly what items in my household have added sugar. And it is, I have 88% organic dark chocolate that has mm. three grams of added sugar per serving. And I also have a kombucha that I love that has two grams of added sugar per serving. And the reality is like, yeah, I, I know those are not gonna, those are not hurting me too much. And I, I really enjoy them. And they don't cause a glucose spike on my glucose monitor. And so I'm sort of like, okay, well, this is going to be what I do. I'm going to have my kombucha. I'm going to have my added, you know, my 88% dark chocolate. And I feel just fine about that. But for the most part, I'm looking at like I bake with, 
I bake with a lot of dates. I bake with unsweetened applesauce. Mm. I oh, bake nice. with bananas. I I use I just try and use whole food forms of sugar because then I'm going to get all the vitamins, minerals, and fiber along with it. What I find so interesting about this is, at first, this sounds. Some people will say again. Casey's a party pooper. This is no fun. You're trying to take away my chocolate croissant. That's what my children say to me. Good. But, you know, what I've found over time, and I'm sure you found this too, is that two things. One is that we can get used to anything, right? I mean, I used to, I used to drink coffee with sugar in it, and then I gradually reduced the sugar. And now if I taste coffee with sugar in it, it tastes bad to me, right? So, 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 so much of this is just about acclimatization, right? To modifications in our diets that I think can be done gradually. And then the second observation is that for me, understanding what these foods are doing to us, to our bodies, changes my relationship with them. Mm. And this is true both in a negative way when I understand what, what added sugars are doing to my body, both the short-term and the long-term impacts, but also in a, in a positive way. I mean, all this knowledge that you've accumulated in your many years as a, you know, as studying as a doctor and now many years uh, since, I imagine that has changed the way you think about the food that you eat. And I imagine, reading your book, that you get a lot of joy out of eating. There's a lot of pleasure in your life from eating, right? So do you think as a message to people that it's possible to change your relationship to food and not sacrifice the pleasure and the joy? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I I really do. I mean, my life is so, like, surrounded by thinking about and sourcing and cooking and enjoying food with community. And I think that it's important to understand that in a way we've been brainwashed, I think, because with the ultra processed foods that make up 70% of our shelves, which we all forget, like this is a very modern invention. This is like a 75 year old invention basically since World War II, that now makes up 70% of the calories we eat. And it's designed and engineered by food scientists, many of which came over from the cigarette companies to the ultra-processed food industries after cigarettes took a downturn. And they are designed to make us essentially become robots addicted to this food. Like, it's we're we're kind of being controlled by these foods to think that it's pleasure and normal and joy, but it's actually a brand new phenomenon it's a it's essentially a food experiment that has failed because it's all it's making us we know that ultra processed foods are making us sick it's literally making us lose our minds it's making us depressed it's giving us alzheimers this processed food is terrible for our health and yet we are we associate it with like joy and pleasure because it's what we know and because we're addic- addicted to it and so when we actually convert over to you know saying no to this dependency that's been put on us, basically. Eat real, unprocessed, nutrient-rich, fresh food for a short period of time. I would say one to two months. Our microbiome changes, our neurocircuitry, and our reward circuitry changes, and we become those annoying people who basically are like, I love spinach with garlic, and I love salads, and I love broccoli, because actually your biology changes to finding lots of pleasure and joy in what we're actually really meant to eat, which is natural, fresh food. But I think for many of us, and I've been here, you know, when I dealt with my food issues when I was a child and um, again in residency, like I know that feeling of really believing that these ultra processed foods are associated with joy when in fact it's actually a dopamine loop that we've essentially been born into that we have to understand enough about what's going on to have the strength to break out of it and know that there's another side to it where we can find just as much and actually much more satisfaction in whole real foods. But it's a journey. It's a journey to transitioning over to that. But the other side is much brighter because we're healthier and the food is serving our highest purpose and we have so much more capacity in ourselves. So in my home life, I don't want to totally out my boyfriend and his experience in the podcast, but <laughs> you know, he moved in with me and you know, he was someone who was definitely trying to be healthy and was doing a lot of good things in his life. But when he moved in with me, you know, obviously things would kind of got ratcheted up a notch because I'm so focused <laughs> on this. Imagine. And we, you know, we've we've lived together for about a year and he he's so sweet. He says to everyone, you know, it's it's so amazing because we eat all this fresh, beautiful, unprocessed food, and he doesn't really feel like he's missing anything because we can have, basically, we have everything. We have 
almond flour pasta. We have beautiful lettuce-wrapped bison burgers. We have, you know, homemade baked sweet potato fries. We have beautiful cakes made out of, you know, healthy grain-free flours. And so it's like nothing's missing, but it's all just kind of like an upgraded experience. Well, Casey, my wife and I are available for uh, dinner parties if you're throwing any recently. I guess we have a little, a few thousand miles between us. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to have you guys over. That sounds delicious. That sounds wonderful. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. From the minds of visionaries to the desks of disruptors, I'm Lars Schmidt, host of the Redefining Work podcast. Join me each week as we explore the new world of work through the lens of those shaping it. CEOs, HR leaders, investors, and more. Be a part of the conversation that changes everything. Subscribe to Redefining Work today. Let's do a a lightning round to cover a handful of other items because we have finite time and there's so much fascinating information here. Okay, so let's start with oils. Boy, was this a wake-up call for me. They're not all the same. What should we eat? What shouldn't we eat? I mean, very simply, we want to avoid all of the industrially refined, chemically extracted vegetable oils. So this is like vegetable oil, canola oil, safflower oil, some sunflower oils, corn oils, cottonseed oil. First of all, who the hell knows what a vegetable oil is, right? Like you take a vegetable, like what does that even mean? And so, and no one knows what a canola looks like. What is a cotton seed, right? Like these are things right, that we don't right. even know what they look like. And the way that they're extracting oil out of these things in this very like mysterious process is chemically pulling the oil out of the plant. So using things like hexanes and actually some very toxic chemicals to pull the oil out, then they have to heat it to purify it, de-wax it, bleach it. Then they put it in a plastic bottle that is usually a clear bottle, which means it's exposed to light, which can then oxidize the oil further. So we're getting these essentially chemically manufactured refined oils that are high omega-6 content, which is pro-inflammatory, and more easily oxidized because they've been heated and exposed to light. And so those are going to basically universally not be good for our biology. So I would just say never, ever eat those and read labels voraciously to avoid foods that have them. The spoiler alert and the bad news is that most processed foods on the shelves yeah, have it's, these. It's, and so it's everywhere. this eliminates about 95% of the things in the store. And it's absolutely worth it to get rid of those things. The oils that are going to be less prone to oxidation, better omega-3, 6, 9 fatty acid profile, and more antioxidants and sort of benefits in the foods are going to be things like avocado oil, olive oil, and coconut oil. And a a way to visualize how these are different is these are fatty fruits where if you squish an avocado or an olive hard enough, like oil would come Mm -hmm. out. And so they can actually press oil out of these things. So you don't need the hexane and the bleaching and the de-waxing. And often these are going to be in glass dark bottles and they're going to be cloudier and they're going to be more natural. And so Those are going to be better oils and have more antioxidants, which essentially protect them from from damage. Uh, So those are better options. And then from the animal fats, which are going to be more saturated, which, again, also helps them resist oxidation. This is things like pasture-raised organic beef tallow, lard, ghee, grass-fed butter, And you only want to get really good sources of these so that they're as clean as possible. And I think those are also good options for high heat cooking because they're they're more saturated fats. They're going to withstand heat better. Interesting. So I stick to all the ones on the second two categories there. Okay. Continuing the lightning round, pickled foods. You suggest eating multiple times a day? 
I do not. No, because pickled is actually very different than fermented. Oh, that's what I meant. So, that's what I meant, fermented. So common, yeah. I know, I know. But I, the only reason I, I'm saying is because a lot of people confuse pickled and fermented. And so pickled is, they, they create a similar end product, but pickled is where you're using vinegar to pickle a vegetable. And so you actually add vinegar to the plant and that turns it into pickles. For with fermented, there's no vinegar added. You're actually just taking the plant and the natural bacteria that's living on the plant and adding salt and water. And there's a natural fermentation process where the bacteria are breaking down the carbohydrates in that plant and then creating basically more bacteria as well as acetic acid and other acids um, that give you the vinegar taste. But that's much healthier than pickled because there's going to be live, active bacterial cultures in it, which then are really good for our microbiome composition, but also those bacteria are digesting the, like, let's say it's a cucumber or sauerkraut cabbage. It's digesting, in digesting the carbohydrates in the sauerkraut, those bacteria are making what are called postbiotics, which are chemicals like butyrate, which are actually really good for our health. And so those are going to be in the fermented product and we're going to get to benefit from those. So uh, so we want to eat several servings of fermented foods per day that have live active cultures. So this means things like sauerkraut, kimchi, Greek yogurt. I love beet kvass, which is like a low sugar kombucha made with beets. Very low sugar kombuchas. Most kombuchas these days, unfortunately, are basically like soda. So really read your labels, look for very low sugar content. Those are some of my favorite fermented foods. Continuing the lightning round, movement. How do you think about the best way to incorporate movement into your life? Well, the way I think about movement, again, it's all through a metabolic lens. So I'm always thinking first principles. How do I make more mitochondria, make each mitochondria essentially younger and more efficient, and have each mitochondria processing more energetic substrates? Like that's what I'm trying to do with the stimulus, the mechanical stimulus of exercise. And so I incorporate a little a different exercises that do a little bit of each. I do resistance training to essentially 3D print more mitochondria. When you're lifting something that's weighted, when you're lifting a force, it's basically a stimulus to your muscle to make more energy factories because you need more energy to do that. Mm -hmm, and so that's mm -hmm. an amazing mitochondrial biogenesis signal. Similarly, like endurance training, like where you're kind of doing a long, slow jog or a long swim or a long, hour-long bike ride, you're stimulating the body to make more mitochondria to meet that demand. So that's there. I'll do a little bit of high-intensity interval training each week. So that's more like sprinting and burpees and things like that to give the stimulus of mitophagy, which is to actually recycle old mitochondria. And then I think about walking throughout the day and just like sort of low grade movement throughout my day. So like using my treadmill desk or taking walks after meals to actually dispose of glucose through all those mitochondria that I'm both making and recycling. So that's how I think about movement. I would say to boil that down, though, like we all need to be doing some sort of resistance training. Yes. Two to three days a week hitting every major muscle group. We are so under muscled. Peter Tia talks about this. Gabrielle yes. Lyon talks about this. It is an epidemic of low muscle mass in our country. And I love what Dr. Gabrielle Lyon says. We are not over fat. We are under muscled. Cardio is great, but it's not enough. We need to be actually like building more muscle. Intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating. How do you feel about those practices? Yeah, I mean, I think that they can be very, very valuable when we look at them through the right framework. Ultimately, we are diurnal animals that have two phases to our biology. We have a phase that is when there are photons hitting our skin and eyeballs, which is the daytime phase. And that is when we have certain metabolic activities that are supposed to happen, like feeding and digestion. And then we have the nighttime phase when there are not photons hitting our skin and retina, when we're supposed to be doing things like rest and rebuilding and repair. So when I think about time-restricted feeding, Essentially, it's a fancy word for just saying, let's respect our chronobiology, the time-sensitive aspect of our biology, and eat when we're supposed to eat, which is during the daytime light hours, and abstain from too much eating after dark when different processes are supposed to be happening. Because food is a signal that helps entrain 
our biologic clock. And so we want to match it with the time when our biology is meant to be doing those processes. It's when we mismatch, which is what most Americans are doing, where we eat over a 15-hour window every day, that yeah. we start to get mass biologic confusions at our bodies. So I think we, we overthink this whole time-restricted feeding thing, and it gets contentious. And really, it's like actually just respecting our chronobiology and, and trying to eat in a more narrow window during the day. So I'd say that the simplest way to do it, if if you're just getting started, is is to try and eat when it's light out and not eat when it's dark out. And that will automatically put you into a more narrow window. And then the second way to think about it is that when we are giving our body more time without calories, that's more time that we have less glucose exposure to our bloodstream and less basically push for the body to keep secreting insulin to take glucose out of the bloodstream. And giving our body a rest from glucose influx and insulin rising means that insulin will fall. We'll have more time for insulin to fall and for glucose to get back to like homeostatic normal levels. And when that happens, our body can then switch into using fat for energy, which in the average American, I bet very few people are ever really tapping into their fat stores. We actually kind of know this because 74% of the country is overweight or obese. We have too much adipose stored energy essentially in fat because we're, ver- we're virtually never giving the body an opportunity to have low insulin levels, which is the switch that lets us go into fat burning. So those are the frameworks through which I think about why time-restricted feeding, i.e. eating in a narrow window, can be helpful because you're getting more time to have lower insulin levels and you're matching your eating habits with our chronobiology, both of which are totally physiologically normal and beneficial, but which our modern culture has thrown off. To end on a happy note, let's talk about dying. (laughs) Uh, And I'm serious about the happy note because you actually have a kind of inspirational account of how you've changed your relationship with death, you're less afraid of it than you used to be. Could you tell us more about that? I had, in some ways, the good fortune of being with my mother at home during her final two weeks of life, during which she had gotten her diagnosis of stage four pancreatic cancer and had 13 days between her diagnosis and her death. And being able to be with her during that time and actually witness the way she processed this surprise diagnosis and this impending demise was actually just so inspirational to me. She she faced it with just total fearlessness, with curiosity, with with actual joy. She, you know, was able to be at home and just be with people she loved, read letters from people she loved. And that was a really profound experience for me to see that, wow, in our in our Western culture, it's almost like it's a given that we should be petrified of death and avoidant of even thinking or talking about death because it's just, it's it's so bad. And I think it makes us so existentially afraid of this thing that is basically the only commonality between all humans is that we're all, we all have this guarantee of death. And so as I reflected more on that, I think that there's a bigger message, which is that it's not necessarily normal to be totally existentially afraid of death. You look at a lot of other cultures, like Eastern cultures, and you read Eastern poetry or indigenous cultures and their texts and their, you know, rituals and, or like even go back to the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, all of them are writing about, thinking about, meditating on, talking about the cycles of life and death. And in that curiosity, I think we make a lot of peace that actually lifts what is ultimately the biggest overarching umbrella fear that I think we all have that kind of drives all other fears, which is mortality. And when I then reflect back to my time in the healthcare system when I was a surgeon, and I think about, wow, the healthcare system and actually so many other industries really benefit off of all of us having this almost like subconscious, constant existential fear of mortality. Because when we're so removed from having a framework of how to think about it or appreciate it or learn from it, we kind of become these like feeble, scared humans that feel like they're very much just living on this material, live for today sort of realm 
and want to basically seek out any solutions, quote unquote, from the healthcare system that could possibly ameliorate this fate. So it's like, I'll take any drug, I'll do any surgery, anything that can prevent this thing from happening. And then on the more consumer side, whether it's technology or digital stuff or food, it's like, how can I get a dopamine hit to basically make me feel better about this like very tough life that we have to live where we're, you know, have this terrible end. And so I think in actually really like diving into a deep exploration and in some ways transcending the grip of that unexamined fear, we become just more stable on our feet in terms of how we are interacting with all these industries around us that are preying on our existential fears. And it doesn't make us never want to take a pill or never want to get a surgery or never want to scroll through social media. But I think it makes us understand, again, this like very complex matrix of exploitation that we're living in that drives $10 trillion plus of industries that really benefit on us feeling small, scared, mortal, alone. And we can transcend that. But I think we have to know what puppet strings are affecting our lives that we may not see every day. And I think one of the big ones is the lack of curiosity in our culture about this phenomenon. And when we really do reflect on the true nature of the human body, the true nature, which is a process, which is a swarming hive of self-assembling matter and energy in the cosmos that has this deep, miraculous ability within it to actually transform energy. We are incredible miracles. We are dynamic throughout our lives. And, you know, I think even after our lives, all our matter is going to go back to the earth to create new beautiful entities. And that's amazing. And I think when we get back to that sense of deep meditation on the miracle of our bodies and its ability to be a transformer of energy, it is such a richer footing for understanding our health journey. Because as opposed to striving for longevity, which is this like future fear avoidance goal that is still an attachment to an outcome, essentially anti-death, we actually can shift to focusing our choices, what we're going to eat, how we're going to sleep, how we're going to move, on maximizing the present moment, on our ability to be metabolically healthy, to be transformers of energy, to reach our highest purpose today through our choices, which ultimately will lead to longevity, but it's a different framing that's focused on abundance rather than fear. So what I've come to in this intersection between my personal journey, between the disillusionment I have from how I think industry and especially healthcare weaponizes fear of death against people, and understanding also the biology of how our fears hurt our biologic functioning. And that I think each of us as an American, as a Westerner, needs to understand this and examine it to like really have the best health that we really want. You call this fearlessness, which is the highest level of good energy, last chapter of your book. And I also love your observation that we're all connected. We're both connected through to that which came before, that which will come after us. Our bodies will nurture plants when we go. Before that happens, we're connected through our communication. And this book of yours is an uplifting message, I think, for everyone. And uh, I like your observation that we're touching other people's metabolic health through the books we put in the world and through conversations like this one. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Casey, for being with us today. My blood glucose is about 105 right now, and I'm feeling great. (laughs) Amazing. I think I'll feel even better in months and years to come because of your contribution to this conversation about health. Mm. Uh, So thank you. Thank you so much, Rufus. Thank you for reading the book. Thank you for the absolutely beautiful questions and commentary. And I just really so enjoyed this conversation and really grateful to you for hosting it. Healthy food. Boy, it tastes so good. Me one healthy dude. Cut me eat healthy food. Me love it. Boiled or stewed. Yeah, yeah. Whole or chewed. You feel just great. Eat some healthy That was Casey Means. Her book, Good Energy, is out now. To learn more, visit caseymeans.com slash goodenergy. 
This conversation has caused me to reassess a lot of my habits. It's an adjustment. When I read the labels on the food in our fridge and cabinets, it turns out they're added sugars and cheap oils in almost everything. But I'm making progress. I'm now making my own salad dressing, which Caleb has been doing for years, and forgoing nibbles of those chocolate twists that my wife orders. I'd love to hear about your health journey and your thoughts about this conversation. Just search for me, Rufus Griscom, on LinkedIn and join the thread under my post about this episode. We're going to invite Casey to get in there as well. By the way, healthy living has become a major focus of ours here at The Next Big Idea. We've interviewed leading physicians and scientists, even the Surgeon General, about the practicalities of improving your diet, sleep, relationships, and exercise routine. To make it easy on you, we've gathered those many episodes into a single playlist that you can access in the Next Big Idea app. Just go to your app store and search for The Next Big Idea. Today's episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger, who wants me to remind you that it is only for educational purposes and it is not a substitute for professional medical treatment. Our sound designer is Jason Freeman. The Next Big Idea is a proud member of the LinkedIn Podcast Network. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.